Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Cynthia Baldista, and I have my colleague here with me, Albert Romero. We're going to be um, presenting today about um, how to evaluate websites. Uh, so I am going to uh, start, and then Albert is going to share some websites, um, some samples of some websites that we can evaluate. Uh, but I'm going to start today by talking about the difference between using a website and a database um, when doing research. So databases, we usually know that will contain information that is written by professionals or experts that study in the specific field. Whereas websites, anybody can write a website and we don't know their level of expertise in the subject. Uh, databases contain published works where facts have been checked. They, I, we know that um, they are peer reviewed uh, and in websites, we don't necessarily know if any expert has checked the information. Databases will offer information that's easy to cite in a bibliography, and they will even create the citation for you. Uh, and websites do not, add, do not always provide the information that you need in order to complete your citation. Databases can also help you narrow down your topic or can suggest um, related searches, whereas websites often aren't organized uh, to support students' research needs. And finally, databases are updated frequently and include the date of publication, whereas many websites may not indicate when the page was last updated. So these differences make it um, a little more difficult to know when a website is useful when we're talking about research. And so it's important to learn how to evaluate your results so that you can um, find the most relevant and useful information um, when you're searching online. But sometimes we do have to go to websites because we don't always find the information that we need in databases. And so some examples of when you might have to go to the web to find some information is when you need up to the minute news. For example, if you want to know the latest information about COVID-19, you might not find that information in a database or in a book because it's too current. So you would have to go to a website for that information. Uh, also, if you're looking for government publications or reports, statistics, such as the latest unemployment figures, you're going to have to go to a website for that information. And sometimes you just don't find enough information in books and databases. And we do have to remember though, that when we are searching online, there are a lot of issues that we have to be careful with. Um, like I said earlier, anybody can publish anything on the web. So you do have to be careful about where you're finding your information and who wrote it. Um, there's usually frequently inaccurate and biased and outdated information in websites. So um, you do have to keep that in mind when you're searching the web. And one of the most important ones is that only a limited amount of scholarly information is available for free on the web. And in this graph, you'll see that what you can find by doing a Google search is only maybe 4% of all of the information that's available. Most of the scholarly information, the um, um, databases, everything you will find in the deep web, which means that you usually have to pay for access or you have to go through a, a different uh, means to access that information. So doing a simple Google search is not going to find you these results. So now we're going to talk a little about um, how to evaluate the information that you find online. When you're looking for information for personal, professional, or academic use, you need to be um, careful to evaluate the quality of the information that you found to determine if it's trustworthy and reliable. And for this, you can use the CRAAP test. The CRAAP test is an acronym uh, that stands for currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. It was created by a librarian from UC Chico, Chico's library, and it's gonna help you decide if the information that you found is appropriate for your research. The first letter in the acronym stands for currency. And with this, um, with currency, you're going to decide, determine if the information that you found is timely, if it's current, how long ago was it written, um, 
like I said earlier, on a database, you can control that by limiting your search for maybe like the last two years. But on a website, when you're doing a Google search, um, you don't always know if the information is current or not. Uh, so does the source um, have links that are current? Many times we find a lot of links that don't work and that might be a clue that maybe the website is not up to date. And for relevance, does the information that you found on the website fit the needs set, uh, for your research topic? What aspects of your research question does this source answer? Is the intended audience appropriate for academic research? Is it written maybe for like a fifth grade class, for example, or is it written for um, experts in, that are way above the, your needs? So you have to de determine if the information that is presented is relevant to your specific needs. So let's say that you're researching about the SpaceX program and you find a website that talks about Elon Musk, the founder. But this uh, article talks about Elon's baby's name. That, you know, is not going to be relevant to your project. So you have to determine if the, the information that you found fits into your uh, research needs. The so next one is authority. What is the source of the info, information? Uh, who is the author or the publisher? Do you know if they have like credentials to write about what they're writing about? Um, or even the website where the information is found. Do you know who this um, organization is? Do you know if they are reliable sources, if they are accredited, for example? Uh, what are the author's credentials? Just because somebody might have a PhD, let's say in astronomy, doesn't mean that they would be a good authority talking about autism, for example. So you have to take those things into consideration. They might have a degree, but does it match your um, research needs? And then accuracy. Is the information that they're presenting reliable? Is it correct? Uh, does the information, does the source contain information that's false? Does it include a lot of mistakes or errors? Does the source use reputable sources to support the claims made? Uh, has the source gone through peer review? This one is really hard to tell when you're looking at a website. Many times it won't tell you um, if it's peer reviewed. And does it align with other sources that discuss a topic? So if you find a website that talks about something and you don't find that information anywhere else or that point of view anywhere else, that might be a sign that maybe it's not correct information. And the last one, purpose. Uh, what is the reason, reason that the information exists? What are they trying to tell you? Is it um, biased in one way or another? All of us do have some sort of bias when we are talking about something, but you want to find the information that is the most objective, that is going to state mainly the fact and is going to try to keep the, the author's bias away from their information that they're writing. So if you can tell that it, the, their purpose is political or ideological, cultural, religious, or you know they have other biases, um, you might not want to cite that in your paper. So yeah, try to determine why the author decided to write this information. Uh, does the source present multiple points uh, of view on the topic? Is the language used meant to provoke a strong emotional response? And this one actually, if you read something that makes you have an emotional response, maybe try to check to see, fact check it to see if what is written um, is true or not. And is the author trying to sell you something or does the author make his or her intentions or purpose clear? And sometimes it's not necessarily the author of the article that you have to look at, but also uh, the organization that is publishing this information. So here's an example of uh, bias versus unbiased language. In this example, we see a sentence that is objective. It doesn't really have um, a biased opinion. So it says, on the first floor of the UWF library, there's a Starbucks coffee shop, which was named after the character Moby Dick. So it's just telling you the facts. There's a Starbucks in the library. The second sentence shows some biased language. 
first we see the, the quote in the middle of the um, drawing that says the best coffee on campus. The so UWF Library Starbucks has the best coffee on campus, despite being named after a character from Moby Dick, who's totally inferior to Queen Quag, a snuggly cannibal. So in this one, it talks about the Starbucks that's in the library, but it's using its prejudice, saying that this is the best coffee and that Moby Dick is inferior to another character. So you can tell that this might not be a good resource to use for an assignment because it's showing the author's bias. And now Alberto is going to show us a couple of different websites, um, examples where we can use some of these skills that we've just practiced to determine if they are reliable sources. Okay, everyone, um, let me go ahead and start sharing, to share my screen here. Okay. Okay, are you able to see the uh, Neil Adnery website? Yes, awesome. So you'll look, you can see by looking at this website, it's a .com. Um, so you, the domain is very important to look at, um, especially if you're doing uh, searches like educational searches or government searches, um, you could do a Google search by that, by a search by entering, let's say um, climate change, right? and then site, colon. And then if you were looking for government agencies, you can do .gov. What that does, it's going to narrow it down to government websites. So the first link here, it's a link to NASA's climate change and global warming site. So you'll know it's from a government agency, so that gives it some kind of um, uh, credibility. You could see that up here, they have facts, articles, solutions, and explore. It gives you statistical information on carbon dioxide, global temperature, Arctic ice minimum. So in contrast, you could see they have several different links. It looks very professional. There's an app. Just more information. You can see they have uh, social media. And then the about us is something that's very important to look at at every website because you want to see what, like who, who are these individuals that are um, producing or creating this website or curating it. So here you've got the mission um, of the global climate change, right? So it's vital signs of the planet to, is to provide the public with accurate and timely news and information about Earth's changing climate. So you could see who the advisors are. You've got Dr. Dr. Carmen Bonny, climate scientist and oceanographer, Dr. Eric Conway, historian. And you could see they have their credentials here, their information. So that's very important when you look at an individual or the author, you wanna look at their credentials. So you could see there's more individuals that work for, or that, for, um, that work for this particular website and cre creating or, or contributing to the website. So overall, you look at this website and you're, you're like, you know, it looks very professional. Um, and it's got statistical information and you can explore different sites. In contrast, I'm going to take you to the other, like this website here. So it's just by looking at the words, America's most swell news source. When you think about swell, is that really a professional word or something that you're going to be using on a website? So what you want to do is just continue to look at the site. There's, looks like there's ads here. It's very important to look at because they're trying to sell you something. And so then the story itself, it looks like it's from um, August the 18th of 2015. So what this is about is uh, 
basically it's about an, an, an American drone pilot video game or game that you could use um, to actually bomb individuals in other countries. If you read more about it, you'll see there's, it's not that long of, a, of an article, right? But if you were to read into it, it's not gonna be very, it's not professionally written and you'll find some grammatical um, errors. So again, we wanna look at the disclaimer about, the, about us. So if we look at the disclaimer down here, Disclaimer notice, the Neil Admiry is America's most swell news source of the spurious variety. So if, you're one, if you look at the word spurious, you're going to know, or if you Google it, it's going to come out and tell you that it's fake. So, it's, so you can see that this website, the currency is off to, it's uh, published in 2015 to 2017, so it's not current information. Again, what you want to do is look at the, the website, look at any of the links and see if they take you anywhere. This is taking you to their link, actually to their site. So again, you want to look at the, the actual wording and the disclaimers, right? If you were to do a search for American uh, drone pilot. In itself, you won't find that much information or nothing at all, to tell you the truth, because I've done the searches and uh, there's no other site that comes up with the American drone pilot game. So that's one, of, this is one example. So I showed you an example of a government agency that was credible, professional, and you could see the individuals that um, contribute to it, right? So there's another article here that I want to take you to. It's um, from GeekWire, and it's Zipline. So Zipline is a medical delivery service that delivers medical supplies to remote areas. It's, it's a California-based company. So here, just to give you an example, now delivers more than 20% of Rwanda's bloody, uh, blood, sorry, supply outside the capital of Kigali. So let's look at some of the links. So here, it's taking you to Zipline. Right? Zipline is divided into different team. We have the flight ops who carry about pre-flighting plans, packing the routing the packages and make sure that plane can fly. Then we have health ops. You can deploy more with the people with the knowledge of the blood product. We may order to Zipline by using SMS or by using uh, WhatsApp. The package is handed to flight ops. You scan the package and that's when we put the vehicle on the launcher. The vehicle will fly autonomously up to the hospital. <laughs> We can avoid experience, we can avoid stockout because the supply chain has improved. We have this life, it is safe life. We want to So you could see that they have a link to their product information, which is very helpful. And um, looks like I lost my screen here. Let's see. Um, let me get to my site here. Okay. So you saw that there's a link to their actual product uh, information on YouTube, right? So there's just more links here that verify the information of Zipline. So this is taking you to an, uh, another article on the drone project, Zipline. Go back and see if there's more links. And here, uh, it's another story actually on GeekWire. 
we're just talking about zip lines, drones, delivering blood supplies to Rwanda. And then it's giving you the uh, uh, individual that contributed to the story, Alan Boyle. He's an award-winning screenwriter and veteran space reporter, uh, formerly of NBCnews.com. So it's a company that we're familiar with, NBC, right? And then there's just more information about uh, like how they're spreading their information, in this case, through social media, right? Just more information towards the bottom. About GeekWire, because we always want to look at the About Us. So it's a fast growing national technology news site with strong roots in the Seattle region and a large number of loyal tech savvy leaders around the globe. So they, it looks, and again, you want to look at who are the contributors, right? Here we've got the co founders. John Cook and Todd Bishop. And this is very, very important because if you're trying to, let's say, maybe borrow or ask for permission to use information sometimes, or just ask questions in general to any individual uh, about a new story whatsoever, you could see there's ways that you can contact these individuals here, right? So you can email them, they're on Twitter, and they even provide their phone numbers. So that's very important. Again, there's more contributors to the site. And there's, they even have a Geek Wire app. So uh, for the um, Apple and uh, Android. So you can see the differences in the sites, right? So I showed you two different dot coms, the Geek Wire. And now let's just actually Google Zipline and see what comes up. Zipline in Los Angeles. That's probably not what we're looking for. So we probably want to add um, drone to it. So here we've got is an American medical product delivery uh, company headquartered in South San Francisco, California. So it's giving you information about the co-founders. And, uh, and of course, this is information on Wikipedia. So of course you want to go down and look at other links. So here's, here's another link by, uh, or actually it's on techcrunch.com, drone live, theverge.com, cnbc.com. So you could see that by just going and typing in zipline drone, you've got several links to other sites. So then you can verify information. One of the very, you want to look at the intent, obviously, about the, uh, about the, uh, about us and the currency, but also where else can you find information about um, news, right? So you want to make sure you verify news by doing Google searches or by going to uh, databases, academic databases. So that's, uh, that's my two cents here on the, uh, how to evaluate websites. So I will stop sharing and hand it over to you, Cynthia. Thank you. Okay, let me go back to my presentation. Uh, oh, I went all the way back. So, like you showed, um, when, when you showed us how to search for specifically, um, if we want to look for a government uh, website, you type in .gov. So um, the website domain gives you a clue on the authority of the website. And the most reliable ones that you might want to look at are .edu, which is Higher Education College or University. .gov, which is a government website, and .org, uh, which is nonprofit organizations and advocacy groups. For this one, you do have to be a little careful because many, especially advocacy groups, might have a slight bias or might have a bias um, or a, a viewpoint that might not match what you are researching. So you do have to be uh, slightly more careful with that. But most 
nonprofits and most groups want to share, you know, want their information to be reliable. So they do try to be careful on what information they're sharing. Dot com is a commercial, um, commercial organizations, uh, shopping, news. So you do have to be careful because anybody can open up a dot com, but there are many sites that end with dot com that are reliable, such as CNN or any of the news sites. And then .NET is the network provider. It offers, um, often sponsors personal sites. So I would stay away from .NET and then .INT is international organization. I, I have a, um, one of the things about .edu is you also have to be, be careful because you might run into a paper that was actually written by a student and not a, yes. a professional. So that's one thing to look out for when you're doing searches. Um, and, and so you see someone like a search through a dot edu, you verify who again who the author is. Yes, you do have to be, make sure that you verify who the author is. That's a really good point. And now the question of the decade: Is Wikipedia reliable or not? Well, yes and no, but mainly no. Um, it's not evil. For example, if you're looking for uh, basic information, you can go to Wikipedia, like like you did Alberto when you were looking for um, zipline. It'll give you basic information. But you do have to remember that anybody can edit, so you have to be careful not to cite. You shouldn't cite Wikipedia as one of your sources. Um, I usually go in there as a librarian, as a public librarian. I at, at my previous job, I used to get a lot of questions from a specific patron that would call and ask, "Has this actor is this actor still alive?" And so like basic questions like that, I would go into Wikipedia to see if this actor was still alive or not. So for basic information like that, it's okay for you to go into Wikipedia, but it's not, um, you shouldn't use it for your educational research paper. However, I do recommend that you go down to the references because they usually do um, cite many good primary and secondary sources that you might be able to use in your research. So, um, you might go down there and find some links that you might be able to use for your assignment. And now we're going to talk a little bit about fake news. So there is a quote here from Barbara Alvarez from the Public Libraries um, magazine that says, what is fake news exactly? Fake news is just as it sounds. It's news that is misleading and not based on fact or simply put fake. Fake news has the intention of disseminating false information not for comedy, but for consumption. So um, here's some tips on how to spot fake news. You have to, like we've said time and again, you have to consider the source. Um, is this, first of all, is the author of the article reliable or is the website a reliable website? Um, click away from the story and investigate the site to see what, the, what just like you did on the just to see what its mission is. Um, if it has any contact information. Read beyond. So if a headline uh, reads sounds outrageous, they're probably wanting to get you to click on it. Um, so read it. What's the whole story? And do more research. See if any, any other sites or any other web um, news sites are offering or sharing the same information. So check the author. Do a quick search on the author. See if they're credible. Are they real? Sometimes they're made up names, so it's good to um, check the author. And then supporting sources, click on the links that they have to see if those actually work and if they're giving any information that is useful for, um, that is relevant. Check the date. Many times um, some sites will share old news and this happens a lot, especially on social media. You'll see somebody sharing a news article and then when you actually click on it it's from like three or four years ago so sometimes they'll recycle uh, news articles that are old and and people think that this is happening now where it might be old news is it a joke um if it sounds too outlandish it's probably satire so check the website check to see if it comes from a website such as um the onion and then check your biases. Consider if your own beliefs could affect your judgment. So um, especially when you're looking at social media, you'll see that a lot of the um, links that you see 
are similar to your own personal views. So they're going to share stories that you're more prone to believe. But um, I recommend that you don't believe it just by reading the headline. If something makes you react, I recommend that you go check to see if there's other websites, if there's other news sources sharing the same information. And if you're not sure, you can always ask the ex experts. So you can ask one of us, the librarians, um, or check one of the fact checking sites, which I'll show you in a bit. Some tips to be aware of when you're looking at news. Um, if a website ends with LO, or if at the end, like let's say you see a cnn.com.co, those might not be reliable websites. If it, the website looks amateurish, um, if it has a lot of mistakes, if they use all caps, if it doesn't look like it's professionally designed, uh, I would stay away from that. They might not be a trustworthy website. If, if you see a meme on social media, that I would not share and I would not cite on an actual um, research paper. And then if it sounds sensationalist, like this next example, breaking news, Google bans cat pics on the internet, a couple apocalypse meow. If it's a, a headline that sparks a reaction, either like anger or surprise, click on it and read it and, or I mean, read it and check to see if other sites are sharing the same information. I wouldn't share it directly or use it in an actual research assignment because they're trying to incite that um, that feeling or that anger or that um, emotion in you. So don't believe a headline just because it sounds real. Make sure that you do your research. And when it comes to breaking news, you have to be careful because as this quote says, whatever you might hear in the first couple of hours after a major news event, you should probably take with a grain of salt. The, this was said by Andy Carbon, uh, an NPR senior strategist. So when there's breaking news, the news medias are usually fighting to see who gets the first breaking news, the, you know, the, the, the first ones to get the information out there. So they might be interviewing people that might not necessarily know what they're talking about, that they might have just grabbed someone that was passing by and asked them for their opinion. So you, when you see breaking news, take it with a grain of salt, uh, wait for a few hours or maybe a few days to see if the information is still true. Because many times people's emotions, you know, might, they might, say something that they might have believed or the news site might just want to be the first ones to get the information out there and and not um, check their sources. And so here's an example of seven types of myths and disinformation. The first one we talked a little bit about that's satire and parody. So that would be a website that has the intention to cause not, does not have the intention to cause harm, but has uh, potential to fool, such as The Onion. They're a satire, and I think your example also, right, um, they, they said it on their description. Um, it, it, sometimes it's meant as satire, but the person that's reading it might not know that this is satire. Um, they might have misleading content, so they might use information to frame an issue or um, individual in a misleading way. Sometimes the imposter content means that they're using genuine sources. They're impersonating a genuine source. So they might use a real name of a real person, but they might not have said what they're saying that this person said. The fabricated content is when the information is 100% false. And so they're, that in this case, they are trying to deceive you. False content is when the headlines, um, the visuals or the captions don't support the content. And this actually happens a lot on news sites. Sometimes they'll use a an old photo or, you know, and, and use it as if it's part of the story, but they just, need an oops, they just need an image to go with their story. So you have to be careful with that. Sometimes the headlines or the visuals don't match the story. 
And then false context is when the information is true, but they're misinterpreting it. So there might be somebody said a quote, but they're telling the story in a different way where that's not what the person that said those things was trying to say. So they're giving it a different context. And then manipulated content, sometimes they'll either crop a photo to show, um, to, to prove their point, which might be a false point, or they might um, edit sound. So they'll manipulate the fact that they have the content to try to deceive the reader. And here's a list of some fact checking sites that you can use when you're doing re your research. Um, SNOPS is one of the most popular ones. There's factcheck.org, is this true, PolitiFact, Hoax Layer, which focuses on email hoaxes and identity theft scams and spam, and then the Washington Post Fact Checker. So that's a good way to see um, if the information that you found is true or not, or if there's other sources that um, are saying the same thing as this source that you found. And do you want to read the well, last one, Alberto? <laughs> well, I was going to suggest one little thing here, um, and I'm going to go ahead and share before that. Um, you know, one of the things that we want to do is, and I hope you could see my screen. Let's see. You can see where I'm at, right? I'm at the Santa Monica College Library um, website. So, and Cynthia said that you can, where a lot of the information, you know, when you do a search on Google or uh, Bing, you'll only get about 4% of that, right? You might be like looking for an academic article and it's going to actually um, maybe take you to the publisher's website. And then for a fee, you would be, you could gain access to that particular article. But, you know, when you can find that same article under databases or using the OneSearch tool, um, whether it be, uh, I don't know, we'll just put uh, drone video game games. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's go. So you could then see um, by doing a search, and I'm doing the search on um, one search. You could see uh, you have under format. You could if you're looking for web content. There's web resources, so then you could actually refer to these web resources. Um, again, there's other um, other tools that we have at the library, like the actual. Um, oh, and I was gonna say um, sometimes when you want to read, you find an article, let's say from the LA Times, but then they ask you to pay for it. Yes. Sometimes you know it's not free. They have, and especially I think they'll give you a limit of how many views you can have a month. So if, if you can't access it through a Google search, you can always also find it through the databases. That's true. Yes. Yeah, they, they do that, like uh, they hook you up on with Wall Street Journal or any other, other newspaper articles. And of course, you know, we have access to them as uh, faculty for the students and uh, everyone that is part of a part of the Santa Monica College community. Um, all you have to do is you can either go to the first all databases and you can maybe do a, a search under newspapers, right? And you'll see that there's a few different, um, we don't want to go to the California digital. We probably want to go more to newspaper uh, source because it's yes. given us current information or um, US news stream here. So it's going to want you to authenticate by using your Canvas login information. So from home, you might get the screen and you gain access to uh, by logging into your campus information. You could do an advanced search. So you could select even the publisher. Um, there's ways of doing that. And you could, there's different types of documents you could search for, newspaper articles, what, et cetera. And of course you wanna enter keywords, not a phrase like it's Google because this is not Google, it's not a search engine. So. That's one excellent point that you pointed out, uh, Cynthia, about you know, using our database for that, for verifying information. So again, um, we have a wealth of information here that you could use. 
Um, if, if you have any questions or you ever get stuck, um, you can always ask a librarian. We have um, the ask a librarian feature. It's, and that is right here. So you can, um, during the library's, op well, when we're open virtual hours, um, you'll get a, a Santa Monica College librarian, but after that, you'll get a librarian that belongs to a consortium. You can always ask us questions or send us emails. All right. So now going back to the, uh, let me stop sharing. Oh, let me, let me share it again. So students, if you're watching this, um, oh, I think I'm, can you see it? I, I, I see it. I see it. Uh, the word is spurious. That's going to be the extra credit word. Um, if you watch this video, you wanna, the uh, spurious is the word to get, to gain uh, extra credit. Yeah. And you mentioned it during your presentation. It was in one of the websites. That's right. yeah. <laughs> I was paying attention. <laughs> it was in the uh, Emerald, Emerald Lee website, the one that is a satirical website. So, spurious. I mean, that was website. part of the, that was the disclaimer. It, it was a spurious website. So yes. there you have it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Cynthia. And uh, I'll stop recording. And...